February of this year, I woke up in a hospital bed. It's not on. Very much alive, but not wanting to be. I'd taken 82 prescription pills. I'd had enough of life. I wanted out. I'd made a suicide attempt. In fact, I was hooked up to a drip for a week. I couldn't stand. I had my dad holding a bottle in one hand and me in the other, propping me up. But sometimes failure is the best form of success. Over the past nine months, I've grown from strength to strength, made possible through the intensive support through both friends and family. But not everyone has this same support. In fact, only a month before my own attempt, I was at a funeral of a friend for the exact same reason. He was only 19. So where am I going with this? Now, you might be wondering, what do all these numbers have in common? Well, I'll walk through them. Now, according to the Office of National Statistics, in 2018, 6,502 people committed suicide. In fact, a study in 2013 by the World Health Organization found that of those who die before the age of 75, there's a 1 in 140 chance that they'll die as a result of suicide or self-related injuries. Your eight, in fact, to put that into perspective, the chance of dying as a result of murder or assault is 1 in 1,201. You're eight and a half times more likely to kill yourself than to die as a result of others. To put it another way, coronary heart disease, the biggest killer amongst both men and women, stands at 1 in 33, only four times more likely. Now, what if, in February, I felt like I could talk to someone? In fact, my best friend at the time had come over. I wasn't in school that day. He'd come to check that I was all right. Inside, I was screaming, praying that he'd know that something was up, that he could tell I wasn't OK. And yet all my body could do was reaffirm that I was, in fact, fine and that I'd see him the next day at school. But of course, this wasn't the case. But this problem's much bigger than just me, my family, my friends. In fact, even the country. You see, Europe, as it stands in the statistics, has the highest suicide rate of all continents. I'd like to take an example of where we can improve. Now, we're all aware of the 2008 financial crisis, and we're also aware of how badly this affected Greece. Historically, there was a taboo on mental health. Nobody wanted to talk about it. Nobody wanted to know it existed. And as a result, we saw that in the five years following, suicide rates rose by 40%. In fact, depression rates rose four times higher. But as a result of this, conversations began. People started talking. You see, with 12.3% of the population clinically depressed, it's hard not to. As a result of this, in 2009, a study asked the question as a response, how much do you agree with the statement that depression is a form of self-weakness? Now, in 2009, in the early days, 63% of the respondents favorably agreed with it, saying that it was a form of self-weakness. But the same study went back five years later in 2014, finding only 36% of respondents agreed with the same. As a result of this and many other factors, Greece now has the lowest suicide rate in Europe at 3.8 per 100,000. To put that into perspective, the UK currently stands at 11.2. Taking an example closer to home, the Dartington Social Research Unit published a study in 2013. They assessed the monetary value of cognitive behavioral therapy in adolescents. Over a 10-week course of CBT, at an average cost of £229 per person, they found an average, later on in life, of £7,252 was saved. Now, I'm not using this as a way to say that we need to spend money in places and cut money elsewhere, but rather that this does work, that therapies help people, especially young people. So why not teach it earlier? You see, growing up, I absolutely loved books. I remember fondly in nursery, 
where I'd sit down and read a book from the age of about two. I'd go home at night and I'd have a book read to me before I went to bed. In fact, at age four, I was talking to a close family friend about an article I'd just read on dark matter and how it affected black holes, something you really wouldn't expect. But I was doing it because I loved it, because it affected my life. I believe that books are a great way to teach children about mental health. Not in the scary sense, such as depression and anxiety, but in a more child-friendly way, talking instead about feelings, and that sometimes the ones that don't feel so great are okay as well. Now, as part of my therapy, I started writing poems. From these, I then wrote a children's book in the style of Dr. Zeus. I did it about my small dog, Mocha. There she is. Now, it follows the story of her going through a barnyard, meeting different animals. She comes across many animals, such as a horse and a goose. She's talking to them about how she could grow big and strong to go up high, even asking the goose how to fly. Of course, this is completely impractical for a dog. With her ears, however, there might be some potential. <laughs> now, I use these to get emotions across. In fact, I did a study of my own. I took this to 20 practitioners in nurseries and primary schools, and I asked them to read it to the children. I provided four questions with it. What did the small dog want to learn? Of course, that was to grow big and strong, but that wasn't really something that she could do. I then asked, how do you think she felt when she learned her lesson? You see, she met a mouse who had a different perspective on life. He saw her as the giant that she wanted to be, only because he himself was lower. The children responded that she understood that she could be happy, because although she wasn't big and strong, she was to some people, that she was unique. I asked, how do you think she felt before she met the mouse? One kid responded that she was a little bit upset because she couldn't be big and strong like the others. But then I asked, well, how do you think she felt after she met the mouse? They all agreed that she might have felt better because they understood that she could be herself and that to other people, she might not look the way she did to someone else. What surprised me was the emotional intelligence of the children that I was working with. Characters that I hadn't even considered, one in particular, a bull who was crying, were brought into question. They then asked, well, why was the bull crying? How could Mocha have helped? How could he be less upset? I also asked for feedback from the practitioners themselves. Now, one practitioner said, that it gave a real story about individuality, that it's okay to be different and to express yourself in your own way. Another said it was very thought-provoking, even as an adult, and that it was great for the children to learn about this in such a way. The last practitioner I spoke to said that it was an essential piece of literature something which children really needed to hear to understand their own feelings. But I didn't just speak to the practitioners, I spoke to the management too. I asked them for feedback about how they thought it would go down in their nursery and whether they'd even like it. Bit of a long quote. They said that the message was powerful, that they made them think that they'd be welcome to have it in their nursery, that they'd enjoy it, and in fact, they said, let me know when you're finished. I want to buy a copy. Now, before I go, I'd like to share a short story of something that happened to me as I was preparing for this talk. I was going out for a drink with a friend when a young woman approached me by name. 
I didn't know who she was. I didn't recognize her. But she said, you're Nathan Emberton, right? To which I said, and who are you? She wouldn't tell me how she knew me or even her name. I didn't recognize her face, but she told me a date to look in my messages. She wouldn't show it in front of her friends, but confused as I was, I went home and looked. Now, as it turns out, I made a post about mental health months ago. She'd messaged me, offering support, and as the conversation began, it appeared that she herself had had issues too. She asked for some support and advice, which I gladly gave. I forgot about it within the hour, but what touched me was the fact that she could notice me, a stranger, in the street amongst thousands of others, someone she'd never even met who had just helped her months ago, someone who'd forgotten about it straight away. You see, it's not the big, grandiose gestures of kindness that really affect people. It's the small things, the ones we forget about, that make the biggest difference. You see, to dream big, we must first start small. Thank you.